Penn State On Demand is a service of Penn State Public Broadcasting, and now you can support WPSU when you shop online. Visit WPSU.org slash shop to make purchases from national online retailers, and WPSU will receive a portion of the sale with no extra cost to you. So start your online shopping at WPSU.org slash shop. I do some consulting work on the American feeling in the room was You don't ever say to her that what about the Chicago incident? We left for the community. We're doing in autism. You might say our next guest wrote the book on concussive head injuries. Dr. Ruben Echemendia's comprehensive textbook titled Sports Neuropsychology provides guidelines for making critical return to play decisions for athletes at every level. Prior to pursuing a full-time independent practice, he served 15 years as director of Penn State's psychological clinic. With sports-related concussions on the rise and mounting evidence that concussions and even sub-concussive injuries can lead to lasting brain damage, we talked with Echemendia about rule changes that could make professional and amateur sports safer, about the need for preseason evaluations, and about why experts are especially concerned about concussions among youth. Here's our conversation with Ruben Echemendia. Ruben Echemendia, welcome to the conversation. Thanks, Patty. It's good to be with you. You're a neuropsychologist. You're also one of the country's leading experts on uh, traumatic brain injury or concussion. First, explain for us what is a neuropsychologist? A neuropsychologist is an individual who's trained in psychology and then more specifically in brain behavior relationships. So our our science, our clinical practice is really trying to understand how the brain works with respect to behaviors and how behaviors show up with respect to any type of dysfunction or even normal functioning within the brain. One of the things you're uh, very interested in is concussions. Uh, first, explain what happens to the brain in a concussion. We well, have to imagine that, th that the brain is sitting in fluid inside the skull. And a concussion really is an accelerating, decelerating injury. Because what happens is that the skull gets accelerated or the head gets accelerated. The brain accelerates along with that. Then there's a point that it stops. When that deceleration occurs, then the brain shifts back and forth. So it's this violent shaking back and forth of the brain inside the head, inside the skull, that causes inside the concussion. Inside this fluid. Inside the fluid. That's correct. And so what's happening? Well, the, the, the brain is literally a, a ping pong ball going back and forth. Well, as it goes back and forth, one of the things that we've come to learn now is that that creates a, what's called a biochemical cascade in terms of the cells of the brain, the neurons. And that biochemical cascade then renders the cells inoperative. They're, they're not working at that point in time. And consequently, we start seeing lots of uh, symptoms. We start seeing lots of changes that go on in the brain at that point from a biochemical standpoint. There are also microscopic, very microscopic structural changes in terms of the cells and in terms of the axons, which help the cells communicate with each other. All those factors then become affected by a concussion, and we see this changing over time from the time that the concussion occurs to the recovery period some 10, 12, 15 days afterwards. And to really know the impact of a concussion, you need to have what you call a baseline test, a baseline neurological test. Is this something that most uh, athletes today are getting before they begin football or soccer or, or hockey? Many are, uh, certainly not all are. Not all schools have the capability of doing baseline testing. And the baseline testing is useful because what it does is it allows us to assess these brain functions, learning, memory, attention and concentration, How well did you do this before an accident? How well you do it before, so then when you get hit in the head, when you have the concussion, we're able then to make a direct comparison to what you look like after the hit to what you looked like before the hit. I read an article about one player who, who, who ended up with permanent brain damage, and, and one of the things his parents asked was, how is it that my son was wearing a helmet that was three years older than he was? Tell us a little bit about helmet technology and if there is a helmet that can actually protect from concussion. The misconception out there is that helmets can protect against concussion. Helmets are not designed to protect against concussion. They were designed to protect against skull fractures, lacerations, penetrating head wounds, 
all of these things that can happen to the brain that, that are catastrophic and that are problematic, but they're not designed to protect against concussion. Because if you remember what we said earlier, the concussion occurs when there's acceleration and deceleration of the brain. If you have a hard shell helmet and it doesn't absorb any of the blow, it's just translating that force going back and forth. And some would argue that the weight of the helmet actually makes it worse because it creates more of a pendulum swing, if you will, to the head. So helmets, to this day, are really not designed to protect against concussion. Now, there's interesting technology that's coming down the road. Hopefully, they will be able to do a better job with respect to concussion. But the biomechanists are worried because if we try to make a helmet that protects against concussion, will we then go back and start seeing these skull fractures and other nasty traumatic brain injuries that have pretty much been eliminated not by only, helmets? Not only that, when kids and when parents think that their kids are protected, you see parents encouraging their kids to butt heads. Correct. Yeah, there's, there's, this, there's this notion that's called risk compensation. That the more warrior-like we get, the harder we hit. So the bigger, the better helmet that we have, there's a tendency then to overcompensate by hitting harder and taking more risks. And, and that can be problematic. Now, uh, which sports are you most interested or, or most concerned about when it comes to concussion or concussion risk? Well, I think I'm concerned in all sports. There's, there's no one set sport because there is a misconception out there that only football or hockey create concussions. We see a significant number of concussions in cheerleading, for example. We, we see significant numbers in, in soccer. So there are sports and activities that people don't expect the concussion to occur, but yet they do occur. So it's not really one sport, but, but all of them, because the injury is the same in all of these sports. It's just the mechanism that's different. We have more uh, young athletes playing football, and so football probably gets more attention in part for that reason. But you just mentioned uh, cheerleaders, and according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, there is greater concern for girls and concussion. Why what might that be the case? There, we know from the research that in similar sports, women and girls tend to have more concussions than the guys. And there's a lot of speculation as to why that may be the case. One reason may be neck strength. And that is that the guys have stronger necks compared to the women, so they're able to control the acceleration and deceleration of the head better than the girls. They can anticipate more, they can tighten their trunk, and hence the head doesn't go back and, and forth And they learn as much. how to fall too, don't they? They do learn how to fall, but I'm not so sure that that is a critical issue. The neck strength seems to be something that's important. Technique may be something that is also important with, with guys learning better technique early on than girls, but that's also debated. There may also be hormonal issues that are associated with a concussion, and there may be different times during the menstrual cycle where you may have a neuroprotective or state in which actually the changes in the hormones help protect against concussion and other times when they don't. The jury's still out on that. The other interesting aspect of that is one thinks that maybe girls and women are more willing to admit to symptoms than guys are. So and willing to sit out. And willing to sit out. Well, even just willing to admit to symptoms because then that's when the diagnosis of concussion occurs. Now, uh, all concussions are not created equal. Give us some idea. That, what's the difference? There's, there's a range of severity from, from mild to, uh, to severe. Explain what the difference is. The best understanding of the difference is how many symptoms you have how long they last, and how much of a burden they cost at that point in time. It used to be thought that loss of consciousness was the marker of the severity of concuss concussion. We no longer think that. We know that when those symptoms occur, if they last two days, that's different than a concussion where they last 30 days. We also know that amnesia is important. So loss of memory for events prior to the hit or after the hit also help us determine what the severity of a concussion is. So, so tell us what symptoms you're looking at and my guess is that you look at any sporting event very differently from everybody else. Well, I tend to look and see what's going on with the head. But you don't know where the ball is, you know where the heads <laughs> yeah, are going. Right, are looking around. <laughs> but what I'm interested in understanding is what the athlete remembers about the particular event, how they can describe what happened to them and the extent to which they can't 
describe what happened to them. What they look like, what they sound like as they're talking, and that's really in the acute phase to see what's going on for them. Are there changes in personality? Are they slower than they normally are? Are they having difficulty coming up with words to tell you what's happening for them? Then post-acutely over time, what we really want to look at is the extent to which they're able to focus their attention, they're able to learn, they're able to remember new information, and then they're able to recall that information after the fact. So we're really looking at all those characteristics of brain functioning in order to determine what's happening. Now, you work with athletes at the professional level. You work with the National Hockey League, the U.S. Soccer Federation, the U.S. National Soccer Teams, the Pittsburgh Penguins Hockey Club. You also work with minor league, college, and, uh, and high school sports programs. How seriously are professional athletes taking concussions today? And is there a sport in which they are taking it more seriously than others? I think that at this point in time, professional athletes are beginning to recognize that this is an injury that they need to take seriously. It used to be that this was an injury that was a nuisance injury. It was just something you had to play through, you had to work with, made you feel uncomfortable, but you just had to deal with it. Or at times people laughed at it because of the, the funny behaviors that may have occurred, someone being ringing repetitious. Ringing. So it, it was thought of as a joke. At this point in time, professional athletes don't think that anymore. They've seen too many of their colleagues having to retire because of concussions. They've seen their colleagues having to extend long periods of time when they can't play because of concussions. So they're starting to recognize that early identification is important. And I think that that's true across professional leagues. The National Hockey League has been working on this since 1997. That's when they first established their baseline testing program. So it's been around for a while. Some other leagues are starting to catch up at this point. But I think that athletes are beginning to embrace the notion that this is an injury that needs to be taken seriously. The, uh, the National Hockey League has been looking at concussions since 1997. You've been involved in that since that time. But they didn't actually begin to uh, create policies regarding concussions, I think, until 2007. But that was still far ahead of uh, baseball, for example, and basketball still has no policy. Correct. W what happened to the National Hockey League is it, it started off, in essence, as a research program because we didn't know much about what would happen with concussions at the professional level. And as time evolved and we gathered data, we began to understand how well these tests functioned in a professional league. In hockey, it's particularly problematic because we have players from all over the country, all, all sorts of countries, who speak different languages. So it's very difficult to assess them, and we needed to know whether these tests were able to do that reliably. Once we were able to establish that, then we developed the protocols and the policies. But you're right. Some other leagues have not been as deliberate in their concussion policies, but now they're catching up and they're doing what they need to do at this point in time. How about at the, at the high school level? Because there are over a million kids uh, playing football and policies with regard to heat stroke and concussion uh, that are uh, mandated only in 11 states. Other states have pending legislation. What, what's the, I guess, politically, where are we with regard to concussions? Well, I think politically, what's happening now, as you said, 11 states have put through laws, and those laws primarily have to do with education, educating the athletes, educating the parents and the coaches, and removing an athlete from play as soon as a concussion is suspected. And then that player is to be held out of play until they're evaluated by a medical profession, medical professional. So that's the, that's the law, that's, that's the legal aspect of it. The, the trick is gonna be in the implementation that is, how are these school districts going to develop the educational programs? Which educational programs are they going to use? Where is the stick? There's the carrot, but where is the stick? What happens when these protocols and these policies... It's not done if it's not mandated. That's correct. And if it is mandated, how is it mandated? Who is going to, to watch over this? I don't think we need concussion police out there, but we do need to communicate that this is serious and, and we need to be able to manage this injury in a serious way. Dave uh, Durson with the Chicago Bears at age 50, he committed suicide and he intentionally shot himself in the chest because he wanted scientists to be able to examine his brain for CTE. Tell us a little bit about CTE and the protein that shows up when there's been severe damage. CTE is, uh, is chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And basically what the science is beginning to identify now through 
autopsies. This can only be done once a player is dead and the brain is examined through very extensive staining in order to be able to identify these particular proteins in the brain. What they have found so far is that in the brains of some athletes that have had long histories of concussions and subconcussive blows, that they've identified these tau proteins, they've identified these unusual accumulations of proteins in certain areas, which is the, the CTE. The, the research is very preliminary. It's important to recognize that it is telling us that we need to look at this very, very carefully. But the research is also preliminary in the sense that there really haven't been no controls that have been studied. There, there isn't a, a prospective program in place, or there hasn't been a program in place, to be able to identify how is this happening? Why is it happening? Does it happen only to athletes? Are there other factors that may be causing this? Is substance abuse related to them? Is a family history of Alzheimer's disease related to them? There are all sorts of factors that still need to be sorted out in order to definitively be able to say this is what happens as a result of multiple concussions or subconcussive blows. That's not to say that it's not important. It is very important. And what it's telling us is we need to manage the injury carefully and we need to do more research in order to be able to identify who gets CTE and who doesn't get CTE and what are the factors that are associated with that. Developmentally, uh, kids are at a disadvantage. You can imagine a seven-year-old whose head is proportionately so much bigger. If they fall, what's going to hit first most likely is, is their head. But why else? are you and other neuropsychologists more concerned about young brains than old brains? And, and maybe, I'm, maybe that's not exactly uh, true, but that's what I'm reading. Well, the, the brain in a young child is still developing. Our brain isn't fully developed until about the age of 21, 22. So there's a lot of development that occurs. If a brain injury occurs at different stages of development, you can then have very significant long-lasting effects downstream where they're having difficulties in multiple areas, including education, their schooling, how they're be going to be able to progress. So we're very concerned about young children. We also know that children and adolescents tend to have symptoms that occur that last longer. They tend to have more symptoms. And they also tend to have symptoms that are long-lasting cognitive symptoms even when the physical symptoms have gone away. So they feel fine, but they continue to have difficulties processing information in the traditional thinking abilities that we look at, which of course makes school very difficult. The implications of this are, are, are mind-boggling to me. I, I, I read a study, the University of uh, Purdue did a study on, on helmets. Uh, they, they outfitted high school students with helmets and then sent them out to play. I think there were very few, if any, uh, diagnosed concussions. And yet, as they tracked these students over the season, their cognitive abilities got worse throughout the season. Yes. And that's... That's an exciting and interesting area of research, and that is not necessarily the concussion, but what, what's referred to as the subconcussive blow. These repetitive blows that are occurring, are they having an impact on the brain? Are they causing, in this case, temporary dysfunction because all those players return back to normal when they stop playing football in the particular study that you cited? So what's going on that's causing that? If this goes on over multiple years, does that then have a problem downstream? Does that then lead to CTE? Those are important questions that we need to take a look at. And what does this mean when, when kids in the U.S. are starting peewee football at five or six years of age? Absolutely. And being encouraged by parents to be aggressive, to play very physical ball, to hit heads? Absolutely. We're in a culture at this point in time where we're expecting so much of our children academically and athletically, we push the competition, we want them to excel, and perhaps in doing so, we're are asking them to engage in behaviors that may be dangerous for them early on. We're not teaching the appropriate techniques, or we're thinking that these young kids should be practicing the way an NFL player should be practicing, and that's just not the case. 
And of course, they're emulating the pros. Uh, so I, I do wonder what impact. I, the Green Bay Packers are, are, according to the New York Times anyway, they're regarded as a, a style of play that's better safe than sorry. And the Pittsburgh Steelers as uh, remaining to have this uh, defiant traditionalist attitude about concussions. And of course, this trickles down to how young players behave. Well, th there's no question that there are differences in how people understand concussion and whether they are altering their practice techniques, their practice schedules, their game techniques as a result of that. Some teams are very much doing that, some sports are very much doing that, and others are, the jury's still out, if you will. They haven't been convinced yet that this injury is something that should be used then to modify the sport. The notion is that the sport is the sport and we're not going to modify the sport based on injury. The motto uh, of the NHL is if in doubt sit them out or sit it out. Uh, is that translating to the parents and the, and the athletes you deal with um, in your practice? I think to some. I think we also have a long way to go in order to get them to, to understand that. For athletes, there's that drive to compete. There's that instinct to, uh, to compete, if you will. They don't, they don't want to pull themselves out. They don't want to talk about symptoms. And parents, many of them still don't know the sit them out routine. They, they don't understand the, the full extent of this injury. And we need to do a much better job at educating parents about what this injury can do. Explain what second impact syndrome is and, and why sitting them out is such an important call. Second impact syndrome is actually it's a controversial syndrome that is thought to occur when the effects of the first concussion have not fully healed and you get a second concussion on top of that. That second concussion then causes all sorts of changes in the brain that leads to dysregulation of blood flow and it can have very significant consequences including death in many cases. It tends not to, to happen, or it has not been identified in anyone really older than 21 or 22. It tends to be more in the late adolescent years. The fortunate thing is that it's not a frequent occurrence. It is a very rare type of injury. The reason I said it's controversial is that there's, there's a line of research and there's a line of thinking that says you don't even need that first concussive blow, that a second that a blow in and of itself can cause the same kind of changes in the brain without necessarily having to have that, that first blow. Having said that, we do know that when one concussion occurs on the heels of another one very quickly, or even a hit occurs on the heels of another before concussion. Before you fully healed. Be before you fully heal, or even before you come out of play, you tend to have symptoms that last longer and are more severe. That's why identification of this injury early on is very important. The sooner we can get them off the ice, off the field, and onto the, to the sidelines or onto the bench, the better off they're going to be in terms of managing that injury. We know that in animal models and we know that in the human model. Uh, you know, many people uh, know that uh, Steeler Former Steeler quarterback Terry Bradshaw announced that he's feeling the effects of numerous concussions. He's talked about uh, memory loss, about problems with eye-hand coordination. And I'm wondering, uh, do you think we'll be hearing more stories like this? And I guess more importantly, do you think we'll be preventing more stories like this? I think that we will be hearing more stories like this. And that is our clarion call to try to understand what's happening there. Is that indeed the concussions that are causing that? Are there some other factors that are interacting with the concussions to cause that. So we need to get a better understanding of that in order to be able to prevent it. I also think that we're getting better at this, that the injury is being managed more appropriately, and that we're not going to see as many as we would have had we not had this educational program. Talk a little bit about uh, your efforts, because one of, uh, one of the things you're doing is, is helping to get the word out. Uh, I'm just wondering how difficult it is in the office when you're talking with a, with a student who is anxious to get back. They think their life depends on it, their team depends on them getting back into play right away. You know, help, help them see long term. It's hard to get a 16-year-old to see long term. It's hard to get a 21-year-old to see long term. But I think what's happening is that we are able to, at least in my case, I'm able to point to some of the professional athletes that they look up to and say, look, you're getting the same management 
that they're getting. I would give them the same advice that I'm giving you. That is, you need to sit out, and you know that they're sitting out. You know that they're playing it safe in order to be able to have a longer career. They start to get that. They, they're not happy with it, but they're starting to understand that they need to really think in the long term as opposed to the short term. And when I, what I do is I explain it to them in terms of would you rather miss one game or two games or would you rather miss 40 games or would you rather end your career at this point in time because that's what we're looking at. We're looking at the possibility of you terminating your year, your, your career, and do you want to do that? Have you had to tell professional athletes one more concussion and it could be curtains? Yes. Not easy to do. It's not easy to do. It's, um, it's one of the toughest things that, that I have to do in the role that I have. But at the same time, I have to tell myself why I'm doing this and that we're really trying to prevent these long-term catastrophic injuries that really could have long-term consequences to their psychological health as well as their, their cognitive health. And what helps me is talking with players who have retired after the fact and who come back and they say, you know what, I'm glad I did that. I can see now where I wasn't seeing things very clearly in the past when I really wanted to continue playing and I recognize now that it was a good decision not to play. All right, Ruben Echemendia, thank you so much for talking with us. You're welcome, thank you. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Ruben Echemendia. Comcast subscribers can watch this program anytime on Penn State On Demand. Find out how through our website, conversations.psu.edu, where you'll also find more information on sports-related head injuries and additional footage from this interview. I'm Patty Satalia. We hope you'll join us for our next Conversation from Penn State. If you've enjoyed Conversations from Penn State and would like to purchase a DVD of this show or any of our other episodes, order online at mediasales.psu.edu or call 1-800-770-2111. Production funding provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Thank you. This has been a production of WPSU.